All right, as promised, we are now going to start thinking about that second part of the directional derivative, not just the gradient, but also the orientation. So uh, let me remind you that we've got our grayscale image over here, and we computed the gradient. How did we compute the gradient? We computed two derivatives, convolve to uh, determine the x derivative, convolve to determine the y derivative. That gives you a vector valued at each pixel. Take the sum, the square root of the sum of the squares of those, and you get the gradient. So wherever there's a white pixel here, it tells you that there is a strong response in the underlying intensity. But what it doesn't tell you is anything about the orientation. It doesn't know the difference between a vertical edge and a horizontal edge. Of course not, because I've just thrown away all that information in the gradient. And intuitively, you might think that the orientation might have a little bit more information. So what I'm showing you here is the orientation map that has been color coded with the color bar right here. So uh, positive, big, large, uh, so 180 to minus 180 from cyan down to blue. And when you look at this, I think most people will agree that the gradient is a more intuitive uh, representation of what's happening in the image. But I think you'll also agree that there is information here. There is structure there. You can see this sort of weird psychedelic version of Einstein. So there does seem to be some information. And you can imagine that if you're trying to do something like object recognition or even face recognition, that knowing that a gradient that is horizontally oriented or vertically oriented or obliquely oriented might be useful for things like object recognition, object detection, and face recognition. So let's think a little bit about how to incorporate both parts of these of the derivative instead of just throwing one away and not worrying about it. So what we're gonna talk about is so-called histogram of gradients. And the way this is going to work is I'm gonna partition the image into some number of cells. And you have, a, you have a, a degree of freedom here how big you want the cells to be. Here I've done it very coarsely just so we can visualize it, but that's one of the parameters that you'll have to choose for the hog histogram of gradient um, calculation. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go now look at um, the gradient and the orientation in that little, one of the little squares. So what you're seeing up here is a little eight by eight uh, set of gradient values corresponding to the gradient and a set of eight by eight orientation values um, corresponding to the orientation. By the way, let me remind you what the orientation is. So the gradient was the square root of the sum of the squares. The orientation is the arctan of the ratio of the y derivative over the x derivative, okay? So take one of those little squares down there, that's your little block. Uh, Go look at the magnitude and the orientation. And now what we're gonna do is create some summary statistics. So for each value over here, um, I'm going to look at the orientation and I'm going to uh, look that up in this dis discretized version of the orientation. So think about this as a histogram of orientations. You can control how many bins you have. You can make a lot of bins, but then it's gonna be a sparse histogram or you can have very few. So I've chosen a relatively sparse set of bins. So this first pixel right here corresponds to minus 32 orientation. So I'm gonna go into that bin right there and I'm going to put in the gradient. So that tells me that I have this much gradient at this orientation. Yeah? Go over one pixel. That one also falls into this bin and so I'm going to increment that by four. So this is sort of, a, if you will, a weighted histogram. Instead of saying I have representation at this orientation, what you're saying is this is how much representation I have corresponding to the gradient, okay? And then you go to the next pixel. This one has an orientation of minus two, so that goes into the next bin. I put a four in there, that's the amount of gradient. This also goes into the same bin, I've got a four, I add that, it's eight, and so on and so forth. And you keep doing this over and over again for each uh, pixel in this block, and then you do it for all blocks. And what's left over is this interesting representation called the hog, histogram of gradients. So why histogram? Because I've made a histogram according to the orientations and of gradients because of what I'm packing in here are the gradient values. And what, this ha what we have now is for every one of these little blocks over here, we have this sort of vector valued function or representation that tells me how much energy how much gradient, and in what orientations are they? And you can visualize that actually quite nicely using uh, this, this picture right here called the histogram of uh, gradients. And notice here what I've done is this isn't an edge. 
If you look carefully at every uh, one of those blocks, that's why it's more coarsely sampled, you've got this sort of funny little oriented things happening. And what I'm representing here is for every orientation in that histogram bins, I'm telling you how much energy is there. And so by the length of those little butterflies that you see here. And so where it's long, lots of gradient. Where it's short, not a lot of gradient. And then the orientation of those tells me something about the underlying structure. So on the tie, it's horizontal. On the curtain in the back, it's mostly vertical. And these turn out to be very, very good representations for things like object recognition, um, face recognition, face detection as well. So I want you to implement this. Now, I'm not, I could have you implement the whole thing top to bottom. So compute the gradient, uh, compute the derivatives, compute the gradients, compute the orientation, write a loop to go through everything. And really, there's not much to learn there that we haven't already done. So instead, what I'm going to have you do is just use the built-in um, uh, SK image uh, feature hog. So there's a built-in function that will compute the hog for you. Take your favorite image, it can be the Einstein image, it can be whatever you want, and compute it. And actually play around with the images to get some intuition as to what's happening in these representations. And then when we come back, I'll show you my solution. So as promised, we're going to import some libraries, particularly for doing the uh, hog detection. Um, I'm going to load my image. And there's one big command here, you can see it where I'm getting the hog uh, detector. And notice, you probably noticed this when you went to look at the documentation, there's a whole bunch of parameters. So orientations, what's that? Ah, that's the number of bins in our um, uh, histogram. What's the right number? Well, I don't really know. I mean, if it's too small, it's too coarse. But if it's too big, like 360, well, you're going to have this very sparse representation. And so something in between. I typically do things like 8 to 12 to 16 or so. And of course, that's going to depend on how many pixels per cell. So here I've done the block 16 by 16. Of course, that itself depends on the resolution of the original image. If you have a mega, mega pixel image, maybe you can make these a little bit bigger. But of course, you want local structure, not too much structure. So there's a little tension here between how many orientations and how many pixels per block. And then the rest are just some parameterizations for um, what you do with the output. And so this will generate the hog image. And then there is a command for um, rescaling it so that um, the, the ranges of the intensities are more visual. And then, of course, I'm going to go ahead and display it. And then it looks something like this, very similar to what you saw before. Original image over there, grayscale, obviously, and with a log descriptor here. And again, notice this sort of looks like an edge detector. I'm finding clearly where there are edges. That's where the longer butterfly patterns are. But then I'm also getting orientation. And again, the where, where we use this is not so much for visualization like edge detection, but it's as input in to object recognition, face recognition, face detection. In fact, one of the standard face detection schemes, which you will find in Python, is the ones that are not based on deep learning and modern neural nets are based on hog detectors because the gradient in the orientation on things like eyes, hairlines, the head relative to the background, the mouth, the nose, the ears, tends to be pretty common. You've got certain orient oriented structure here. And relative to that, you've got a nose and a mouth. And so those hog descriptors actually carry quite a bit of information for things that have consistent geometric properties, like the face, and are often used as a pre-processing step. Because it's not obvious that pixels, what you and I look at with images all the time, are the best representation to an object recognition or an object detection. And hog is one very simple but very common type of pre-processing step that you can use to make your uh, computer vision tasks just a little bit easier.